Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of the uh, FEDSA on, uh, online streaming talks. Um, we're very glad today to have Ryan Skinner and Tim Higgins from Games Global, and they're going to tell us a little bit about the work they do and uh, their experience uh, working within games dev industry. Um, it's quite an unusual one for us, so we're very glad to have them on board. Uh, and I think we've had game devs on before, so it's a great it's a first for us. If you're unfamiliar with FEDSA, just to know that we run uh, weekly, I'm sorry, weekly, that would be too much work. We run monthly talks online and we run monthly workshops as well. So two events a month. We've got a workshop coming up um, in April that's uh, going to be on web scraping. So keep an eye out for that one. It's going to just be a lot of bit of practical fun um, if you're keen to join in. And then we also have a sister organization, uh, ZA Product Design, and we run a lot of uh, events uh, around the UI design and product space as well. So keep an eye out for that. As usual, we will uh, publish those on our meetup group, uh, and uh, you will you you should get an announcements with the, for those um, shortly. I see we've been joined by Skulk, who's a co-organizer, uh, lurking in the background on YouTube. Hi, Skulk. Nice to have you. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll start the talk very shortly. If you have any questions that you'd like to present to the speakers please just type them in the YouTube live chat and we'll be noting them on this side that you come through us automatically. And at the end of the talk, we will, uh, we will uh, go show your questions on the screen and, um, and, and get some answers to them. All right, so without further ado then, I'm gonna hand over to Ryan and Tim and remove myself from the street, from the stream. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, thanks again, uh, Ryan and Tim for, awesome. for joining. Thanks for having us here. It's uh, it's really, really great to be here. Uh, this first talk uh, is primarily, uh, I'm going to focus on it. I am going to ambush Tim with a few uh, questions for anecdotes and his opinion every now and then. So I'll leave his intro to um, a little bit later uh, when he does uh, his talk. I hope he has done an intro for himself there. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk on game development in JavaScript with a particular focus uh, within the iGaming industry. My aim for this talk is to act as a primer for future talks to introduce developers to the gaming and JavaScript in general, if you've not, you know, you're not aware of it. Uh, if you are aware of it, but you're not very current with it to hopefully give you a spark to, to relook into it. And if you're in the the, the game development industry already reach out to us and can connect it would actually be incredibly great to you know just to grow our network of uh, developers we know especially developers using uh, javascript i think tim would appreciate me saying that because this talk has a, a bit of a soft skills focus that is a direction i tend to take the talks um, I'm surrounded by very capable and strong developers where I work, so I'm quite comfortable in leaving the, the hard skills talks to the likes of Tim and the other developers that we have that uh, have expressed an interest in and in talking at, at future events. So uh, let me just go. There we go. Cool. Um, my screen isn't changing, but I can see it changed over here. So just as an introduction, I'm Ryan Skinner. I'm the software development team lead for Half Pixel Studios at Games Global. Um, I'm an aspiring narrative driven indie game dev in my personal capacity. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm also a mentor. I, I, I try to be. We have got two graduates starting in our studio uh, next month. And I'm going to be essentially mentoring them. Tim is already mentoring a fairly new starter in our studio. So I'll be handling our two uh, graduate starters with the help of Tim and the other developers in my studio. And I also have a friend who should be in the chat here that I'm busy mentoring uh, to uh, become a software developer. Uh, it's at the early days, so you can maybe let us know how it's going, if I'm doing all right there. Um, and I'm also an ex-British paratrooper, and I was in a unit called Special Forces Support Group for a period of time. I also mentioned that a little bit in my story. And I'm soon to be streaming on Twitch, debut 15th of April. Um, I don't feel, pre feel prepared at all for that. I'm going to be streaming uh, mostly game dev and fumbling about trying to figure things out. So if anyone wants to uh, join me there, my handle is pretty consistent. It's Arkansa. It's the same as my, my, my Twitter handle. 
So just an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, my story, the short version, I have a much longer version in another talk that I do, but I'll spare you that one here. Uh, just game development uh, using JS in the iGaming industry. Uh, two common stumbling blocks that I would like to address that I've picked up in a lot of conversations that I have. And the talk I'm doing now, it's I might veer off a little bit because this is actually a conversation I have with developers and I, I haven't really tried presenting this in a, in a format. It's generally a discussion I have on Discord uh, with other devs in groups of people there. So I, I will try my best to stay uh, uh, on script here. And also just looking at the next point there is broader JavaScript game development and engines. And then if there is time, just a few um, indie dev uh, anecdotes. So my story and what I will say is just simply that I am extremely grateful uh, for the career I have at Games Global. I feel that I narrowly missed my last opportunity to move into game development as, as a career. Um, and it has had a profound effect on my personal development journey as well as my own indie development journey where instead of trying to write short stories and novels which i just couldn't get into i've decided to write those stories in the form of playable games and i've never had traction uh, on the stories the way i have and i'm currently working on a game called uh, without hope and it's one of the games i'll be streaming on on twitch so if anyone's interested in that uh, do do check it out. Uh, I'm going to need feedback on on, on that story uh, and that game as I go as I go through it. I uh, came from a very serious background, as mentioned. I am ex-military, and as much as that was a, a wonderful period of my, of my life, it also made sure that I basically put to rest my dream of doing game development for quite some time. And I started down a path of corporate type development because I saw it as serious and I saw that it, it mattered and this is this is what I need to do. You know, you need to be doing work that's that's meaningful and, and has an impact. But it wasn't fulfilling for me because I am at heart a, a creative. And I reached a point in my life where I was um, actually at the point of going back to what I used to do and I was going to go do close protection. And I knew it was going to job that I enjoyed and felt was fulfilling, but I also knew that um, my life expectancy wouldn't be very long. And I was okay with that. And looking back now, I'm glad that the, the changes in my life came about that set me on this path into discovering my passion again and reigniting that spark for game development because everything has changed for me since I've, I've started uh, down this path of, of game development. And yeah, it's just, I hope that some of what I can share is can inspire you just to check it out, even if you just experience a fraction of the joy that I get from developing games, working with amazing people in, in, in the industry, I'd say it's definitely worth uh, having a look and, and, and checking out. So this is my worst slide because I realized I didn't do a proper primer on um, the iGaming industry before I started talking about it. And diving into a bit of our history of our studio, Half Pixel Studios, is we started off as a studio making slots. Originally involved in being more of a showcase studio for the, um, the engine that these games are made on and uh, absolutely brilliant internal engine. I can't speak much to it. Tim will have more technical details that might divulge some information there of, of interest. But I will start on these games here at the top right. We have uh, Retro Galaxy and I will show um, a gameplay video uh, of it just after this. Um, it was just before my time and I think before Tim's time as well. But I love retro theme games and it's generally a game that I look at the at the player stats of that game and it definitely has a hardcore uh sorry i just saw graham's comment there and i threw me off um it definitely has a hardcore following to it uh, i would love to be able to look into the details of why we still have players playing a game that's been out for for quite some time and there's much you know newer games there's much newer mechanics but it is a game that intrigues me as well so i'm hoping that it is fans of the of the retro theme there just below that with the the mermaids we have uh, atlantis the forgotten kingdom that was an incredibly interesting game to make and i came in halfway through on the development on that i think Tim, as well, you can correct me on that if you uh, started off uh, on that fresh or if you came in during the development life cycle. I think you came in during the development on that. There were some incredible learnings on that game. 
um, even to the point towards the end of the development, uh, because we were pushing, I'd say, the features of the engine uh, to the max. We were really trying to use uh, as much of the features that the engine offered as possible. And we actually started getting a, uh, a context loss issue uh, with, uh, with WebGL. And after much investigation, Wayne, uh, from the engine team, who might be in the chat as well, managed to track it down that it was actually a bug in certain Intel drivers. And Intel just flat, I think they refused to even comment on uh, on his requests to, to to have it fixed. And we had to had to adapt and overcome. And we got we got the game out, but it was incredibly challenging. Um, building on the experience of those games, we cut down our development uh, time immensely on Golden Elixir, and that's the two screenshots uh, on, the, on the left there. I d unfortunately don't have a gameplay video available of, uh, of Golden Elixir, but uh, it was a game that we started using shaders in, and hopefully Tim will have some, t some time to talk about shaders in his talk. I'm always pushing him to, to talk about shaders. Uh, but those are some of our the origins of, of the games that, that, that we started off as a studio before we moved to the innovation space. And that's where, that's where we're at, uh, at now. And I have a game that I can show that I, we've cloned the game. Our current games are going out ex exclusively to operators now, so I can't show them. And our, our current main game we're working on, the industry has never seen anything like it, and I cannot show it to you until it's, it's live. I can barely even speak about it, but it is a phenomenally exciting game to, to work on. So with that, like tease out of the way i'll just jump into some of the uh some of the uh gameplay videos here i'm not too sure how this is going to work i haven't tried playing from here before so let's see how this works Okay, I have quite a bit to get through and a few to, and a few to talk about. Uh, so I won't show too much of, of, of each uh, of each game. If people have any questions about the specific games, just note it down and I'll try and get back to it or answer it a bit later. Um, just on this, I'm always impressed by the sound journey of this. And looking at a game like this, when the when the symbols land, uh, was there um, was there sound? No sound on YouTube. Damn it! That was actually a really big talking point that I wanted to do was talk about the sound of that. So I do apologize. It's just um, there is a huge part of the player journey in these games is the sound. Uh, narrative design often and sound design often struggle from the same problems. If you've played a game where there has an amazing storyline and towards the end of the game, clearly it felt like they actually, they let the, the narrative designer go and then try to finish off some of the game themselves. You can actually pick that up. It happens in sound as well. So it's very important for the cohesive experience of the game design and the sound design to be very tight throughout the whole development of the game. But I'll move across. I'll move away from sound now, uh, because it, unfortunately, it's it's not uh, it's not playing. Uh, let me just quickly hop on to the next. There we go. Uh, Atlantis, and I'm just being cognizant of this. There's no sound, unfortunately. And I'm going to keep reaching out to Tim now, as I believe we use spine animations for the uh, for the mermaids, whereas Retro Galaxy was mostly, if not all, uh, PNG sequences for the uh, for the animation. So it's definitely a progression of our skill set as well. Tim, do you want to answer that quickly? It's all spine, mm. just uh, older versions of spine, and then updated mm. spines later. Thanks, Tim. 
appreciate that. Um, again, the sound, the, uh, you do see the site of the, the site at the top slot, slot catalog.com. You can go check the, all the videos there. If you have a VPN, you can actually play the games there as well. Um, you know, it's just, it's, fr it's free play. It's just to check the game out. It just bearing in mind, you have to be over 18 to, to play the games. Uh, there will be a warning there, uh, listed as well, but there are the videos there as well to get experience of the sound. I'm also incredibly impressed with the sound design of, of this game. Uh, we have a brilliant sound engineer in our, in, in our studio and definitely his, his skills shine through in, in, in this game. Uh, sorry, let me go to the next one. Okay, uh, I said I didn't have one of uh, Golden Elixir, or was our final mm -hmm. slot game we made. This game was by one of our sister studios, but moving to innovation and working closely in hand with the team as we utilize this game, and we've made about eight clones of this game currently that are uh, roughly, that are currently going out exclusive, and it's even a different engine than we used uh, for our slot games. We've actually moved back to the, to the engine we were using for slots, but this was a truly um, eye-opening experience getting to, to work on, on, on this game. Again, forgive me that there's, there's no sound. As mentioned, uh, Buck Stakes made this game and we just, this particular one, and we made clones of it. I'll just let it spin and it should land. I think this one lands on the on the big one. Uh, maybe not. Okay. Again, it's a very good one to go check the audio out on the the, the tearing and then the anticipation is, uh, sorry, is uh, is very very good uh, on that and it served as foundation of us moving creating the clone games within the. Um, innovation space okay let me just move on here sorry um you know just also on the on the on the on the i gaming industry i felt i wanted to mention this it is um a game from another studio uh within ggl however fire and roses joker actually last week was at position one on the uk slot catalog listing and it's quite an interesting game to to go check out i don't have a video of this one yet don't want to spend too much time on it but it was just i just wanted to highlight the the types of games and the innovation that the teams are bringing the studios we get to work alongside with um the games that they're so they're so putting out so i just wanted to pop that there and have a word about that so let me just get back sorry i don't want to get back to my screen there um game development using js in the in the iGaming industry. So uh, while Tim and I are are doing this talk in our personal capacities, there's an incredibly wealth, there's an incredible wealth of information that we can share only because of our careers at, at Games Global. So we will be focusing quite a bit on the on the ice the iGaming side uh, of the of the industry. Uh, we primarily use uh, JavaScript in our sector of the gaming industry in, of the gaming industry as i've mentioned it's called iGaming and what what that means for us is that is the regulated uh gambling industry and we are fortunate enough to be part of the greater gdl games global as individual studios each with our own unique culture and dynamic to making games um as mentioned, our studio is part of innovation department and we work very closely with our sister studios and we sit just a few, like a desk row away from the engine team that's building the engine that we're working on. And I cannot express the, how awesome it is, the feedback loops we have with the engine team 
in if we have issues or if we're not sure if we're you know employing the features that they've built in the best possible manner um having being able to stand up and go talk to the engine team building the technology that you that you're working on it, it is it is phenomenal and it's something that i i truly truly appreciate about being in the in the cape town office um in particular um j just looking at game development from a in our gaming space from, from a high level i try to just water it not water it down just take it down to some of the fun fundamental uh elements that i've seen recently because when we started off uh when i arrived here we had quite a driven uh head of studio and a very very good project manager and the project management tools was essentially driving the game and you can almost see the result in the end product. We're moving to innovation. We moved away from what was a pseudo agile approach to more of a, a Kanban approach and a much um, looser approach to development. But the focus of it was to uh, get rid of silos, to shorten the feedback loops and give everyone more agency in the end product. And a big requirement that was there was that we all understand the, the vision for the game. And that was a learning process in itself. And it, we've definitely uh, come through that uh, much stronger as a team. And we are working in, on amazing games currently. And looking at the fundamentals of embarking on uh, development of a, of a new game, it is fairly agnostic to the technology or the specific sector of the gaming industry that you are in. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that a, a 2D, a, a 2D only engine won't have significant, you know, differences to a engine capable of, of 3D. But if you're using a 2D only engine or an engine that is, has a renderer that is capable of, of, of 3D, in both engines, you're going to get to a point where what you initially envisioned is going to, uh, hit constraints of the technology and, that's what I mean by it's fairly agnostic uh, of, of the technology. So for us in making games, we have an initial kickoff of a, of a concept, of an idea. We've identified a, a gap in the market uh, for you know more regular gaming. It could be um, a narrative that you're doing, and that's something I do in my own capacity. You've identified mechanics that, that are going to, going to shoot the lights out, or there is a very specific player journey that you want to take the player on. And more than likely, there's some uh, mixture of these elements that you're going to be uh, approaching and looking at. And the initial first few sessions are the most fun. I'd like to refer to them as green light sessions. If anyone's familiar with uh, Dale Carnegie's courses, uh, that's straight essentially from his courses where when you sit down in a room and you're busy planning and someone pitches an idea that you feel is uh, either not possible or you know quite challenging you answer in a way that actually supports it and rather tries to figure out how we can make that idea come to come to light and it's something we've tried in our earlier sessions to have these green light sessions that are incredibly fun and i would say it's arguably the second most innovative meeting of these early phases and the reason i say that is because when you get past the green light phase of planning for a game and you have to start looking at the technology you're using the business requirements uh, as well as the the market requirements that when the constraints start coming in and uh i was on a course with john zerplot and and, and dolph flint they're two hollywood uh like producers screenwriters and something they mentioned is uh design is constraint and the moment we start bringing in the constraints and we still want to hold true to the original vision of the game the mechanics the narrative the story and now you have to overcome the these very real obstacles that's where i see an immense amount of innovation coming out of the team uh, it can be quite challenging because you're trying to hold true to to the vision but uh, I haven't had uh, our team fail yet on just coming through with amazing innovation or leveraging the relationship they have uh, with the engine team and having the conversations that need to be uh, that need to be held. And after this phase, you you do enter the I suppose the uh, main mainstay of the game development for that game. We try to keep our development uh, cycles very short. Uh, as I mentioned, we're taking a rather um, Kanban approach, and whenever we have a problem and tooling will solve it, we, we then bring in tooling. We're not having tooling uh, drive our process. As I mentioned, when I first got to the studio, uh, some of our games were, well, our game development was largely driven by uh, by this, 
the project management tools. And in this phase, it is really important for everyone in the team to understand the vision of the game. Because we're working on different components and we're all responsible for realizing when it's going astray, for trusting, uh, for example, the sound engineer when, when they say that this isn't going to work or no, this is going to work. We need to uh, create the visuals that, that match up and tie with it, trusting them that they understand the area and they're going to do their job efficiently and, and effectively. And, you know, we need to bring our side to to that as well uh hey welcome wayne i mean i was commenting and talking about you about you earlier i've just been bigging up your your team so shame on you um and uh so in that moment of the team working and iterating going forward uh with with the game development uh keeping the vision um you know close at hand uh, having a close feedback loop with the stakeholders as well that's generally where you'll start introducing scope creep but in game development, once you have an idea and you can't, you bring that that idea to life, and you start seeing what this game looks like uh, in the hand, well, you envision it in the hands of players. You are the one playing it. You're having conversations about it. Sometimes the things don't work out exactly the way that you you had intended, or you'll find entire gaps in the player journey, the player experience of going from one point of excitement, and you want to guide them towards the towards the next. You don't want to just have you know a a huge uh, win and then absolutely no audio and no sound, uh, you know, almost leave, the, leave them dead in the water. It can be quite a jarring experience. And it's something that uh, we always have to keep in mind when we're playing the game. If you make games, uh, one of the most common things is to switch the audio off because it can get repetitive. And I've seen that uh, catch people out is that you no one's listening to the audio anymore because you've heard it, um, you know, 100 200 300 times a day and you lose you lose scope of what's happening in in the audio and that's a that's quite a common thing that occurs in the game development uh, industry um in general so um it's i've just tried to take it a bit of a high level there instead of going through the technicalities of uh how the you know how we run the projects and that so i hope they made some sense i hope there was there, there was some value within that tim you're busy leading your first game for the studio uh, and that's the game I've mentioned that we can't talk much about. But what's your experience of the first time leading that game and towards how the, the cycles have worked? And, you know, currently with you and, and Heino, how your, your feedback loop is going? Um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we used to go from a classic two-week sprint. Here's your box of work. Uh, you do it. It goes into testing. You never touch it again. But now we have to have this more um, collaborative effort. So you have more waterfall model where you do something, um, other people look at it, you then um, work on it again, somebody else looks at it and goes, why did you do this? And you end up trying stuff and it's not like set, do this piece of work, now you're done. It's like, do this and it might even, you know, we once, we sat in a meeting and we spoke about it and um, we just, move stuff around on the screen to see how it looked and it actually changed the entire way that the game mm. is presented. Um, so it's like interesting, you have to be a lot more fluid and open to, to changes. It's not do this and you're done. Mm. Thanks, I appreciate that. And I can agree with you on as well. I see, I, I see that in the team. Um, and just something I picked up there that you're talking around and I, I, I generally focus on the heart of things. So maybe not everyone in the game development industry agrees with me, but there is a degree of emotion in the games that we're making. You know, it's, it's an emotional experience and journey uh, for the player. And, you know, as Tim says, moving things around on the screen can, can alter that experience entirely. Uh, sometimes, you know, hopefully for the better, but sometimes for the worse. And we have to, we have to keep, you know, always keep that in mind when, uh, when making our, our games. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think now. Sorry, I did, I did say a few things earlier that I wanted to, I wanted to say now. So I've just, uh, I just got to, got to skip, uh, skip ahead there. Um, so I mentioned that I come from quite a corporate uh, background in development, and Tim, uh, Tim as well. Uh, I do want to mention in this time that I find um, the iGaming in industry is quite well suited 
to developers in the fintech industry. Uh, I did work for uh, w systems for the banks. I worked at pharmaceuticals as well as working in the EHS industry. And the type of skills you pick up there actually works incredibly well for the type of challenges and, and some of the seriousness within the iGaming industry itself. Um, you know, this is a lot of focus on, it is a regulated industry. And I've never been in an industry that takes its rules so seriously as, as the iGaming industry. So those experiences, I'm actually incredibly grateful that the time I spent learning and developing those skills, that it's a one-to-one -one relationship with the usefulness where I am now. So if there's any people that are in uh, fintech, uh, pharmaceuticals, any any industries where you're making systems, and you know you, you're dealing with uh, you know fa fairly serious work, it, it is a good industry to to consider. If you looked at game development and it seemed a bit too whimsical for you, there is an incredible amount of creativity and freedom here uh, within the iGaming industry. But there's also a level of, of seriousness where what we do and the decisions we make, the early conversations we have, what we raise when we help people out, it has an incredible impact for your team, your studio and, and the company as, as a whole. And it's something that uh, I found immense value in. You know, despite I said that I was working in corporate development and it wasn't fulfilling, now that I have this crowd of outlet, I'm incredibly grateful that I found that and I can still utilize the skills that are developed. Uh, over that time. Tim, your take on moving to, to this industry? Uh, for me, it's just it's, uh, not too rubbish fintech. It's just way more fun. I mean, mm. because um, I was working in back-end accounting systems, so my day was very monotonous. But um, in iGaming, it's like you have these challenging problems, but they have, they like, presented in this in this beautiful presentation you're not solving a um, financial problem you are solving you know you want this animation or the the sequence of events to be as exciting as possible so it's a lot more fun okay i i, I do agree, agree with that we have spoken about this before so i i, I do know your do know your stance on it but it's good it's good to know that i i, I still remember it verbatim okay cool um and Something I want to mention there as well. I have mentioned fintech and those those types of industries. If you're if you're a front end dev and that's not the industry you're in, it is still an absolutely a suitable move to move to not only game development but the iGaming gaming industry as well. I was just highlighting that that those strengths in those industries are also sought after um, in the industry we're in, and even beyond just making games, uh, there's opportunities for JavaScript development in the entire game development pipeline. Uh, I know this is, I'm talking about Unity now, but I've just seen, and I need to research a bit more because I use Unity, but they now have their live DevOps, DevOps pipeline. And, you know, I won't go into the specifics of it, but we have multiple platform teams where we are that help us in terms of automation, in terms of game delivery, in terms of, you know, handling everything from regulations to, man, anything you can imagine in the game development life cycle. Um, we have amazing, passionate teams creating the toolings for us. And the leaps and bounds that, they, that they're going forward in the technologies and the usefulness and the obstacles that they're moving for us. Um, you know, it's just, I, I'd imagine for the teams that even though they're not making games, it's still an incredible industry to, to be in. So do consider if you're, if you're really not interested in in making games still look at at i i am biased for games global i work here and i love it and i appreciate it but there are some other companies like us as well so you know keep your keep your eyes open keep your ear to the ground uh, on that and maybe it's something you would have glanced over um as i did in the past because i'm going to talk to the, talk about a few stumbling blocks now um you know and i did myself uh, a big injustice um in that so just Please, please keep that, that in mind. So two common stumbling blocks developers face when considering iGaming using uh, JS1 is bias or being overly invested in technologies that first brought a developer into the game development space, very common for aspiring Unity game devs. That's one of my home communities on Discord is the Unity space. So. I myself probably am looking at through the lens of that, that I see so many Unity developers, the moment they hear 
JavaScript. I will have a lengthy conversation with them. Um, they actually don't have a problem with the iGaming industry in general. And the moment they hear a different technology than, than Unity, they lose interest. They, they switch off and they shut down. And I see it as such a, such a tragedy because I see some of these developers still looking for their full-time job in game development, but now it's 12 months, 18 months down the line, and they still haven't gotten experience making games. And they are still hell-bent on getting into a very, I want to be a Unity dev, I will make games with Unity. And the reality is going into studios, um, you know, you're going to often use the technology that best serves the, the game and the product that you're making. You're not necessarily always going to use, use Unity. If you go to a AAA studio, you're going to end up probably using an internal engine, you know, not even um, Unreal. So, you know, I don't think it's a problem with the audience I have here, but maybe you know someone that is looking for that job and is overly invested in the technology that got them into game development and something that you could convey to them to just hey, think about this JavaScript is moving forward in leaps and bounds. And there are places in South Africa where you can, you can get a job and you can be surrounded by amazing people uh, that just love games and love making games. The second point there is unfamiliarity uh, with or even a negative perception towards the, the iGaming industry. And I'm sure someone is, is, is going to challenge me on this. And I'm guilty of this one in the past. In 2016, a, um, uh, a recruiter reached out to me on the phone and they had this amazing opportunity for me. I could hear the passion in their voice. And I found out later that they, at that time they were talking about Derivco. And the moment they mentioned gambling, I shot that down. That, I shot that recruiter down so hard. I think they had to take a seat to process how adamant I was being that I will not share anything further of what they were saying. I had an incredibly negative view of the of the iGaming industry, of just gambling in general. I was playing Lotto. I didn't mind playing sweepstakes, but I didn't sit down and just open my mind a little bit to just understand how the industry works, what the regulated you know, gambling industry is, and who are the players and people involved in that. That's one of the reasons I'm so grateful that I realized the mistake that I had made. And I got the opportunity again to, well, I, when I applied, I started working for uh, Derivco, but uh, last year we uh, formed Games Global. And, you know, in Games Global, we focus on making the games. I should have mentioned earlier that Games Global, we're not operators, we're not casinos. We get to focus on making uh, just amazing player experiences. And the players are really spoiled for choice in the amount of games coming out. You really have to be good at what you're doing. You have to make games that are entertaining and are unique. And the the players enjoy and it's essentially rewarding to to play these games and have this experience and that that challenge is just phenomenal it's what makes this industry so exciting for me is that we have to be making these games uh you know and a step up every every single time a recent example and i'm not going to go too much into trying to convince anyone that i'm sorry i should have said that first i'm not trying to convince anyone here this is my opinion on this i understand that this is a very personal view view, view for most people people had different experiences of this and you know it's a conversation to be taken quite delicately at times and at times a one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and a back and forth back and forth and it's quite difficult to share with me having a mic and other people not uh, you know, uh, having to either, either type in chat. I'm very cognizant of that. I've had these discussions on on Discord. I've had one or two that went badly. And thankfully, the people uh, that I spoke to actually, you know, coached me on why they viewed it the way they, that they did. And I felt I grew as a person from that experience. And recently, um, I have an example of a friend of mine. And he happens to be an ex-instructor from when I did my close protection and counter-terrorism course. And he's in the chat currently that I'm now mentoring to, to become a software developer. Uh, is when I offered for him to help me on a proof of concept of a, of a skill-based gambling game in Unity. He was taken a bit aback by my abruptness uh, on the offer. And he was quite clear that he didn't know where he stood uh, on the issue. And he, he definitely needed time to think about it. And a key part of the conversation is one, I knew when to step back uh, on the issue. And all I did was I conveyed a few pieces of information because I, I had a feeling that, um, Graham, I'm gonna name drop you here, that you, know, you, you, had, you, you, had play, you had played Lotto. 
and uh, you know, just to mention that, and you can you can tell me if I'm accurate on this or not, or if I'm if I'm off the mark completely. I, I you know, the the honesty. I think everyone would would would, would appreciate that if I'm if I'm accurate here. And in terms of discussing that and giving a few details, and then uh, two days later, without me prompting it, that's when you reach out to me and you mention that actually you know what you've thought about it, and you don't mind helping out uh, on, on 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 the proof of concept. You know, you you don't have you don't have anything against it, and it's something I might have mentioned before to to Graham is that, you know, if I look at the the regulated game in the industry they are so focused on the well-being of of the player it, it's nothing like i've seen in any industry before and if i look at triple a triple a gaming studios in what would, one would consider you know regular gaming their microtransactions and a triple a studio that i shan't name there's that story of that patent being found out that they have an algorithm that the if you go too long without you know making a microtransaction, it slowly decreases your accuracy uh, in a first person shooter. And the more cosmetics you buy, you know, within the right amount of times, it, it, you gain a degree of accuracy with your, with your weapons, just enough that you don't, you don't notice it. And, you know, what came out of that is like, no, no, it's a patent, we're, we're not using it. But if you look at the practices of some AAA a studios and just how they treat their staff and in inequality and that, I, I don't put it past them, you know, at times employing those type of tactics. And in no way or shape or form am I saying because, you know, a AAA studio in a competing industry is up to something questionable that we don't need, you know, that someone can't talk, ask questions around the iGaming industry. Um, you know, if it is, uh, you know, if it affects th their beliefs, and just in this instance, for myself as well, I just had to, you know, really relook at a at a ho the whole industry that you know I'm quite invested in for my recreational activities and something I, I find a lot of a lot of meaning in, uh, in terms of that. Okay, so getting to I I am over time now, so I just want to actually check if I have enough time to go on now and that Tim, you've still got your talk ahead of you. Okay, cool. So, game development in, in JavaScript. Uh, and I really want to start off with, with why game development? And I hope that uh, in what Tim is going to say, what some of Tim's anecdotes and what I have said, I've at, we've at least made some compelling anecdotal arguments uh, for considering game dev development. Uh, but beyond that, I think there's, it's no secret that the gaming industry now rivals Hollywood for production value and earning potential. Netflix opening a gaming studio is just one example. And I was fortunate enough to have done a course with uh, the two Hollywood level writers, producers that I mentioned, JZP and Flint Dill. And they really shed light on what movie series and game writers need to focus on nowadays. And when you come up with a story for whatever industry you're in, you need a writer that is going to be a movie, a series, a book, a computer game, a board game, um, and you know, a myriad, a myriad of other you know, merchandise as well. Otherwise, writers are not getting jobs. And they called this before the industry really started making that shift. It was incredibly interesting being on, on the course with them and just seeing the, you know, the insights they have to writing within the industry. Um, and while they didn't say that, that Netflix was opening a studio, I don't think they had that type of information. From what I can recall is they strongly re suggested that they wouldn't be surprised if Netflix did open um, a, a gaming, gaming studio in, in, in the near future. This was about two years ago that I, uh, that I did that, that I did that course. Um, you know, the, I think The Last of Us serves as a very effective example of this being done uh, with, a, with a fair amount of success. And, you know, I'm in the fortunate position where I get to enjoy tools of game development. I get to do my own game development where, you know, I still intend to fully honor the work of art, which is my stories. And taking direction from Rick Rubin's advice in his book, The Creative Way, uh, the best art divides an audience, and there's immense value, uh, and sorry, immense freedom in not relying on my personal art form uh, for my survival. Because in my case, if I'm making a story that's going to divide an audience, and you only get you know 50% likes on Steam, I potentially can't earn off of that. But I don't want to have to do that. I want to be able to make my game in the truest form and serve the art. 
Yet I also get to work in an industry surrounded by driven and amazing people that collaborate to create amazing works that none of us could accomplish on our own. And that is something that also at Games Global is just so phenomenal about the level of collaboration and teamwork we have within the studios, amongst the studios and the teams that, you know, make the various technologies uh, that, that, that we work with. Um, and just, you know, to speak a little bit more around JavaScript um, itself, game development in JavaScript is an increasingly popular way to create interactive and immersive experiences uh, on the web. Uh, it is a versatile pro programming language that enables developers to create dynamic and engaging games with, I would say, um, veritable ease. Uh, there is, Tim actually mentioned something to me today around uh, a course on algorithms that he was doing, how some aspects of, J of JavaScript are actually not well suited to uh, uh, certain performance tasks that might, you know, uh, games might require. And he specifically spoke around uh, the arrays there. So I don't know if, if you've got anything in that, your talk around that, uh, Tim, is probably a bit, too, a bit too recent, but it was a very interesting point you raised there. I'm actually really looking forward to, to doing that course. And any references I have here, any courses I mentioned, I will be sharing uh, on Twitter, or if there's another forum to put the resources out there, I will, I will also be uh, putting them out there. Uh, the JavaScript uh, itself, uh, getting back to on, on, on point on topic there, is a language that can be used for a wide range of game types, from casual puzzle games to complex multiplayer experiences. I wouldn't say it's a complex experiences, but I show Survivio or Survive IO, which is quite an interesting little multiplayer experience uh, written in, in, in JavaScript. And you know, it just JavaScript is a language that can be leveraged to to make games that are both visually stunning and highly functional. Um, there are many benefits to using JavaScript, and one of the major benefits uh, of game development in JavaScript, again, is is the ease of use. And I say that with a with an asterisk at at the, at the end of it. But the types of games we're making in the web, I haven't had any issues around that. Um, JavaScript is also arguably um, an easy to learn language. It's one of the languages, why one of the languages that I, I choose to men mentor with. And in learning JavaScript, there's not only, you're not only locked into game development, there's a potential myriad of front end development that you can be involved in uh, and, and do as well. Um, you know, and developers can genuinely create uh, games with, with minimal effort. Games are quite often, if I think back to how the Celeste player controller used to be, it used to be used as an example. I think it's been refactored since then, but it was something like a 16,000 line of spaghetti, a file of spaghetti code. And it didn't need to be anything else because indie games, especially when they're released, it's generally their biggest time of their earning potential. And as time goes on, that earning potential diminishes and there's no reason to necessarily maintain and keep that game up to date. Indie games do often fall prey to bad practice if it does get, garner a cult following and the developers try and grow the game. Um, and it was written in a way that wasn't sustainable. And there are games like that on Steam that, you know, have died because it just became unsustainable to to add more to the game. Um, so that does occur. And uh, just on that as well, you know, using a superset like TypeScript, TypeScript can help on more complex projects or in larger teams to avoid issues that type safety inherently shields you from. So that is, you know, there's already mechanisms there to to help you if you're working on a more complex project, a project that does need to run longer or be maintainable for a longer uh, period of time. Another advantage is the vast amount of libraries and frameworks available for, for JavaScript. There's, you know, there's almost too many uh, available. You can actually get, you know, par paralysis by choice there. Um, so I do list a few here in terms of just using vanilla uh, HTML5, sorry, HTML5 and vanilla JavaScript. Um, Phaser is a, a you know, a language that uh, won't, you know, one of our, uh, oh, sorry, I'm umming and arming because I don't know if I should mention it or not, but it, it is fine. One of our engines was actually based on an older version of, of Phaser, so I've got some familiarity there. I've been blown away by lately by 3JS and the improvements there. I wasn't paying much attention to that. I've recently seen, and I've got a, um, a link here as well that I will I will share of someone using ChatGTP and making a simple uh, like bubble T 
game using uh, sorry gtp sorry not chat using gpt4 and and 3js uh pixie.js uh renderer um phenomenal as well a uh, babylon which um i thought was just a renderer but i see them mentioning physics on that as well on their on, on their site so maybe that's a, a game engine as well uh, it's one i'm actually not familiar with but i've heard a lot about so i've mentioned that there and there's many more there's even libraries dedicated to specific game types such as visual novels and then um Oh, just my, it's a note for myself there is with the two grads coming in to our studio next month, I actually created an, um, an assessment for them to make a Plinko game. And there wasn't enough time for me to ask them if they minded if I shared that here. So I don't, I don't know their Plinko games to, to show. It was very interesting. The one graduate went the direction of using Phaser and the physics built into there. I did share a link with a very interesting, um, you know, almost vanilla JS uh, pseudo physics system and the other graduate uh, went that route and it's very interesting to see the different approaches and the strengths and weaknesses of, of of both and that was their first foray into you know moving away from being in university to doing uh you know prepping for again i keep calling it corporate development non-game development and yeah i'm quite impressed by the um by the effort they put in and then publishing and uh, monetization and i've got a bunch of slides that i i should have moved on to now um i will i will come back to these I, I do apologize i should have been going through all of these now i was just too too in into what i was talking around uh you know in terms of publishing there's the mobile apps there's publishing on steam for um javascript i still need to look into this more but it does seem to be packages to allow you to deploy binaries h.io is a popular one and in terms of monetization you can actually make the games available for purchase there's Ad revenue you can pursue as well as as microtransactions. I'm not going to go into those into those too much right now. I don't have much experience of that myself um, in JavaScript in particular and that, but they are very viable options for people to to look into and and go forward with. Um, I will just quickly scroll back here as I should have been going going through this already. Um, SpicyYogurt.com has an excellent tutorial on collision detection and introduction to, to game loops. I do highly recommend checking it out if anyone hasn't seen it or someone's not familiar with, with, with game loops or would like to follow a tutorial to make a simple physics-based system to then, you know, extend and, and do something with it. I love taking a tutorial like this following along with it i'd probably go tdd with this because it's not done in tdd i always like doing a bit of an extra bit of work there and i'll take it and i'll make a game uh, out of it and something i quite enjoy uh doing and i i really enjoy that guy's tutorial i find he has a very good knowledge of the subject matter because of how simple his tutorial uh, is i think it's a good sign of uh of someone who knows their um their subject matter very well Going on to Phaser, an interesting game I found was Dead Switch uh, 3. Uh, the links there, I will make, again, we'll make these available. It, um, I didn't get an opportunity to play it, but it is some sort of uh, side-scrolling uh, 2D uh, shooter. Uh, we have uh, 3JS, this is the crafting the bubble tea with GTP4. Um, I need to watch this again. I am going to try and follow, follow along and again, do my own variant of, of this. It was incredibly interesting to, to see. I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Um, Trigger Rally in 3JS is literally a 3D little um, rally game. And I had quite a bit of fun. Uh, playing this game and just seeing what's possible in JavaScript. This is one of like the the, the wow moments that I that I had was playing was playing this game. Uh, Coastal World was a very interesting game about teaching you how to save and be smart with your money. Um, so it was just an incredibly interesting approach to conveying information. Um, I, I really think they they did a, an absolutely great job of it. Uh, then Survive IO, the one game I mentioned. Um, I was trying to log in to get a screenshot, but it wasn't loading for me of like actually being in the game and trying to fight. But I have played this game before, and 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 I quite I quite enjoy it. Um, then uh, I didn't get a chance to play Shell Shock, but Babylon JS has a very interesting uh, online uh, kind of deathmatch type of game uh, going on in JavaScript. So you can also check that out. Um, yeah, and just quickly, I will wrap this up as quickly as possible. So forgive me for talking fast. I'm trying to be cognizant of time just in terms of in, in the anecdotes these are just some screenshots from now using unity 
for the game that you're seeing on the left and at the bottom at the bottom i'm messing around with some pixelation techniques because i do want it to be a pixelated game but i am using 3d models and i was using ai generated art for my menu and just to get a feel of it but my current unity game as well as the one i'm making next year I will soon have websites using Vue.js as well as 3.js as part of the storytelling process. So I'm just finding m multiple ways where JavaScript is just helping me with what I'm doing. I, uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to give spoilers now for what I have intended for, for the games, but there are some of the characters in, for example, the game I'm currently working on with, Without Hope, where they're actually essentially bad guys in the story, but you get to see their... Um, the sad story of their earlier parts in their lives, uh, you know, through the story that I'm going to tell uh, on, on on the website. Um, yeah, I'm quite excited for for that. And then finally, um, you know, as mentioned, I'm currently mentoring a friend to become a software developer uh, using game development as a, not the sole mechanism, as a mechanism in the process. And we'll be using 3JS very soon to create a vertical slice of, of a clone for Endoparasitic. And that's the two screenshots on the left there. It is one of the most simple yet amazing games I've ever seen. I don't own it yet. I've seen Markiplier play it, and I cannot wait to get my hands uh, on that game. And I think it's just such an ideal game to try and mimic. In, in in JavaScript and see what the challenges are. Uh, it's incredibly it's incredibly simple, and you know just I will also be assisting with using JavaScript for an innovative visual novel idea my friend has, um, in an industry that um, I've never seen it used before. I don't want to give too many details. I didn't ask permission to give any more details around that, but it's just JavaScript is bleeding into every area of my um, my game development you know, career and journey, and I'm absolutely loving it. So that is the end of my, of my talk. So thank you. Are there, are, are there any questions? Uh, there's a there was a question about uh, yeah. using any frameworks or libraries. I think you touched on that a little bit. Um, yeah, so maybe um, a little it, bit more about in terms the of ones that you use and prefer, and maybe some reasons why. Uh, Tim, do you want to answer in terms of uh, the space we're in at work, and then I can give an answer outside of work as well. Yeah. Um, so our current framework is proprietary so it's all internal can't really talk about it but um, obviously we use I'll say obviously we use node um, so we use um, sometimes you'll use external frameworks with uh, node modules uh, so you'll use some of the common li common libraries but most of our stuff is all internal um, some of it is built on top of um, other software like uh, somebody mentioned phaser in the chat one of our engines uses phaser as its uh, render library um, so we use that but then a lot a lot of stuff we we usually write in house yeah what, what i find is is the the internal engine we're currently using is um it's incredibly well written and the api it conforms to is if you're used to any other game engine moving and using that engine is is incredibly natural experience um, I actually wish Ray was on the call because he could speak to that. Having come, you know, I, I'm, I've been here a while. I'm also biased. I really like the engine. But you know, when I did ask him for his input when I was talking to the grads, he did say that having the Unity experience did help him immensely with with using the engine we're using currently. So I think that's a testimony to the, uh, you know, to how the API is, is done for the for the engine we're using. We do have a, again proprietary framework, um, and it might, you know, for example, it will handle. Um, any requirements for the client that uh, you know is re of regulatory concern or you know device specific uh, and that so you know each of the each game doesn't have to focus too much on fixing the same problem in every single uh, device that we can leverage some of the frameworks again i'm sorry for stuttering here i just have to be careful how much i say um but yeah so we do use in internal frameworks uh, in terms of my own development um, you know, I don't know if that, uh, don't know if that's part of the question, but 
on for Unity, I do actually look at look at the assets quite a lot. There's two uh, open a open AI assets that I'm actually looking at now. I'm hoping to do uh, a talk, maybe a YouTube video on it of leveraging uh, the tooling as well. I, I kind of view it as, as more of a library in, in terms of that. And then uh, I think there's always, always benefit in checking out uh, what frameworks they are. In Unity Engine, there is a an asset called Top Down Engine that gives you a whole host of functionality to make a top down game. It has inventory built in and all of that. So it is something I've even looked at um, employing there. Um, I just basically see um, I have more freedom in my own development to pick whatever technology serves the the end purpose of the game I'm making as well. So. Um, uh, when and when the mentoring I'm doing as well, I will certainly be uh, employing frameworks, be using 3JS uh, for sure. Great, thanks for that. Um, something of a more, shall we say, philosophical question, mm. <laughs> um, also from Stian, um around dark patterns um, and how you feel with and, no. uh, deal with those. <laughs> that's that's essentially we, we we cannot do that that is the industry is uh, when i said that this industry cares about its players and that there are there's you can google and see which uh either operators casinos or uh game creators have lost their licenses and you lose an entire you can lose an entire hemisphere of the pla of, of the of the planet for that for that type of thing and that so in terms of of of, of dark patterns uh our industry doesn't suffer from that thankfully uh, there is the unregulated industry which is like the wild west and it unfortunately when i talk to people they they don't actually know the distinction it's not their fault but they conflate the two um and it's so when I when I mentioned I should have mentioned this earlier. So this is actually a really good question. I really like it because I wanted uh, wanted to mention it earlier that genuinely the player experience has to be good. You have to have a fun and engaging game where the actual enjoyment of the game is good and not relying on on patterns that you would see in this the social apps on uh, on mobile phones. I did some research into that. I actually get frustrated. Uh, with those, uh, with those social, uh, social gambling apps. Great, thanks for that. Um, question around uh, from Richard uh, that you mentioned AI art, but only currently uses static animations, uh, static images. Sorry, not meshes or animations or three D. Um, what are you currently using? Right. All right. So um, I was talking really, really fast there. So. Uh, Thanks for asking this question as well. I'm currently, yeah, I'm currently using static images for uh, for my for my menu scene as well. I'm trying to see where I can explore with, with parallax, where I can get, some, especially in, in the menu uh, itself, uh, to see what I can uh, experiment with there, or if it's just at this point easier to get, uh, you know, an artist to do it. Uh, for me, uh, I'm just trying to minimize the errors. We have to pay someone to do it. In terms of models, I am relying on uh, creators on the Unity Asset Store. I'm actually in communication with some of them to make sure that you know their assets are available. I can actually use them in my you know in, in my game that they haven't been copied from from somewhere else. But there is something I'm also going. I'm going to be doing a talk on it internally uh, on Monday at our company. But I'm happy to do a video on it. Solus Vision where it's a kind of text to 3D model. It's early alpha. Um, you know, I'm sure they're doing a good job. My current experience of it is it's quite poor currently in terms of the topology of the 3D models. Then there's another one called, for 3D modeling, it's called Kaidem. And I'm not convinced that's not people sat behind the scenes actually making the models. When I upload a picture and it makes the model, the topology was so clean that I did not, be, I, I still don't believe that this is AI generated. And the way it like it, it you can upload multiple pictures, but I can upload a single image of like an anvil and it mirrors the, the, the side and gets the, the back pretty much correct. They were even dense in the in the mesh topology. And I was just like, there's no ways an AI did this. So Kaidem is incredibly expensive, um, but it is something I'm interested in well. And then there's Runway ML that's just launched their Gen 1. And I'm looking into that for, it has video to video AI generation where you can take a video of me just moving like this and you can upload like a fire demon, right? And it'll turn the back screens into like, you know, 
huge fires and you know it, it actually looks uh, in incredibly incredibly cool one of the other guys at our company um in the ai forum we have did a presentation on on runway ml definitely want to check that out i have tried to use sprites get dolly to generate sprites for me and i was basically straight on my way to making a horror game uh, those sprites were like pure nightmare fuel uh, but it's something I would like to actually just make and complete and like this is the best Dolly can do. Um, oh, uh, and they're also releasing Point E soon, which is a 3D model generator that um, it just, in oh, I'm misquoting this badly, so someone can correct me on this, but it maps the points of the 3D object instead of just trying to, in a 3D space, uh, almost using rasterization techniques to uh, generate and guess you know, not just 2D where pixels need to be, but like in 3D, which would take an immensely long period of time to, to do. They're actually plotting the 3D model based on the points, hence why it's called point E, uh, at least what I've heard so far. I haven't got access to that yet, but it sounds like an incredibly cost-effective way and fast way to generating uh, 3D models. Then rigging is a whole nother problem. Animating it is is, is, is a whole nother problem I'm, I'm looking into there. I'm trying to find ways to... to get what I need out of AI on that. Maybe I'm just not smart enough or I, or I haven't, you know, I haven't found the right, the right places yet. I, I, sorry, I spoke for a long time there. I hope that answers some of your, your questions. Uh, no, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, I see your colleague Wayne has answered, a, uh, given some additional information in the, in the chat. Mm. I just thought it would be worthwhile just to pop a few of those up um around one of your engines um with custom webgl uh and then also on the regular um you highly regulated to mm. promote non-predatory yeah. practices good stuff okay there are no other questions at the moment um tim do you have anything do you want do you are you adding anything to the are you also giving a talk sorry Yes. Um, I can speed run it <laughs> unless there's really no time then maybe we can next um, time. Uh, well we can either do that or we can set up another session if you think that would be more beneficial um, it's entirely up to you guys um, we generally do, we generally go for an hour so um, but I'm happy to stay on um, if you if you'd like to um yeah, I can, I'll just. Uh, yeah, yeah. I want to hear what Tim has to say. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I, I can give the, the the less. Yeah, I can. Yeah, speed run. Okay, cool. It'll be fine. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. Ryan is is very passionate, as you can see. Yes, very much so. Cool. I'm going to. Let's see which screen is going to do. Chrome has lost permission to share your screen. We have a consensus. <laughs> um, I've been defeated by a PowerPoint presentation. I'll, I'll just keep showing all the Tim cheerleading while we wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, well he, he has a good question, Ryan. Maybe you could speak to this while we, while Tim just gets his screen up. Oh, sorry, I put you on the spot. Yeah, sorry, I, bu I bumped my mic there by accident trying to. <laughs> I'm using the wrong place. I'm interested to know what the general roadmap is for someone switching from front to end um, into game dev. Um, yeah, that was that's an interesting one. It's something I'm looking at actually creating a course of a course on, um, and I don't want to end up like some of the other you know game devs that they actually make money off of courses and not the 
and not the <laughs> the games they're making. Like, so it's, I'd like to like you know something that's a bit more accessible, and potentially free. I'm happy to write a, an article around that. But in terms of of, of myself, I started um, just getting involved in, in any development. I am quite a Unity fanboy, and I'm quite invested with all the specials they have in the Unity assets, so I kind of can't move away from Unity <laughs> too much if, if, if I wanted to. But if I look at the strength of the um, the JavaScript engines currently, you, you have such freedom of choice. Um, there's so many free assets available on a Unity has publisher of the week a deal every month. Unreal has five uh, free assets that, 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 you know, it's free. And the reason I mention that, it's sometimes quite fun to find, like, they'll give a whole village or a whole, you know, uh, character pack for free and to be able to, get, to grab that and just mess around with it and, and see what you can achieve with it, especially when they give out the animations as well. And there's um, free, and uh, like, uh, tooling for animations for, uh, by Adobe, as well, as long as the characters are, are correctly rigged. And it's, it's finding an, an entry point that you can consistently come to and you enjoy doing. Um, someone asked a similar question in my last talk. And I said for someone that doesn't necessarily have that spark of creativity in them yet for game development, is find something that you're comfortable doing and take a game engine and make it with that. There's actually a guy on the 3.js's three, three uh, gallery quite a I think it's the second row from the top. Uh, it looks like, um, you know, a little dev, uh, game dev tycoon or YouTube tycoon type game. The guy's done his uh, portfolio, his, his, his website about himself in 3JS and his little character that animates on, on the screen and that. And uh, I see something so powerful in, in people doing that just to get themselves out there, be able to get noticed as well, and then have the conversation with uh, with other people. If it's something you're interested in, in, in speaking about more, like reach out to me. I'm happy to have that conversation and answer more specifically to, to, to how you need that question answered. And, you know, we can help others uh, uh, as well. So yeah, like, uh, sorry, I'm talking really long. I talk a lot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks very much. I think the important point is like the ubiquity kind of, of, of JavaScript these days is, is a very useful bridge in that gap, right? Download a framework and start, Wayne says. Mm. <laughs> okay. So yeah, just make you... blocks move around on the screen. Like, okay. that. That you don't need art or anything. You just right. Yeah, just, just start yeah. start to work on mechanics. Yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, Tim, I see your screen is up. You are you ready? Yes. Can I, okay, great. I'm adding you to the stream. And there we go. Cool. So um, my bit of the talk. Uh, Ryan said, "Hey, do you want to talk?" And I said, "Sure," because I'm. Um, my goal, I always, plan, I always hope to say yes when somebody asks me and then I panic and I go, what am I going to talk about? And then um, at the time I was working on load optimization because we have limits to how long a game takes to load and we were a bit over that limit. So I was pulling my hair out trying to figure out, you know, what can we do to, to make this game load faster? Uh, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm a senior developer at Games Global. I'm lead developer on the new game. I was in fintech for like nine years. I've been in game dev for about two and a half years. I'm going to speed around this because who cares? Okay, so some load time challenges that we have. Um, it's different to normal websites because normal websites, um, I say normal, like a conventional website, you load your page um, and that, and that's it you're done but there's a lot more in in the games of stuff happening behind that has to happen behind the scenes uh the longer the load time the less revenue you make it's um, estimated that anything over three seconds of load time you lose 50 percent of, of users to your website and in games it's the same standard the longer your load time the um less less revenue as players don't want to sit and wait for a game to, uh, for games to load for too long um, so the how, you can't just decide I need to make my game load faster. From the very beginning of the projects, we have to have our plan in mind. And it's not just file sizes. It's not uh, just shrink all your assets and or don't have as much assets. Um, there's still, 
you know, there's a lot more to in loading a game because you have to decompress your asset, you load your asset, you run your game and rendering. If you have a 100 meg line, you can download 40 megs in three seconds and that's only downloading. You then still need to load and uh, render the game. So I've batched them into higher and lower level. There's probably better names for it. The higher, um, the lower level stuff, I think I called it, um, is stuff that usually your um, um, frameworks and your whatever you're using to build your game will do for you usually. And then the high level stuff is stuff that we can do on the game side. So for lower level, code splitting, tree shaking and CDNs. Um, so from a code and then the high level, we have lazy loading, progressive loading, sprite cheating and platform based loading. So code splitting, we, we separate our code into modules and then load it only as needed. Um, modern libraries build into bundles. I remember when I started development, um, you know, if you everybody used jQuery, you downloaded jQuery min, you you um, added it to your site and when you loaded a website, you had to download everything in jQuery. You had to, you had to, if you were using it just to make a button, it doesn't matter, you had the entire library downloaded. So now these um, modern libraries are doing is everything has a CLI, everything has a build process, a build step. If you only use a button, you only include the module, the say the jQuery module for a button. That's the only um, only thing that that you load. And anything else you need, um, we would load later. Tree shaking is the then the removal of dead code. Um, using your import and export statements in modern JavaScript, um, any unused classes and methods can be stripped out. So um, say we have a util class that we use in all our games, um, but we only use half of it. We don't need um, certain methods. Tree shaking will remove it completely from, your, from the build game uh, because why download it if you're not going to use it? But this you have to be quite on top of because you know libraries use um, um, these days you can do like JSON files to do layouts and stuff and anything that's dynamically created the um, build tool won't really be able to know about it so then it will get tree shaked and you end up with a lot of errors later and um, Tree shaking also lets it that you can put in a lot of dev code or, or, or dev classes to help with testing. And, um, you know, when we are developing the game, a lot of tools to help us debug and um, play around with how things are working. And you can surround, you can set that those classes and objects to not be part of the build and it will be tree shaked out in a build so that your dev builds don't, your dev code does not go into production. Then CDNs are content delivery networks. Uh, these are for apps at scale, probably not for your um, general, uh, you know, your homemade app probably won't have it because um, data transfer is literally limited by uh, physics. Um, if you are in Australia and the files are hosted in the US, doesn't matter how small they are, how many there are, you are limited purely by the speed of data trans transfer. So what uh, large companies will have is you have your data centers all over the world. And when you're trying to load the game, uh, it serves you files from the closest possible um, CDN, uh, which can actually be quite um, a substantial time saving purely by how long the files take to reach your machine. Then um, this is the stuff we can that we do on the game level when I'm developing. We do progressive loading. Um, we have we set what is the bare minimum amount of files to play this game. You only need one scene. You need one background. You need very little audio, if any audio. Um, you compress it uh, to a uh, a level that's almost too far, but not quite too far. Then when you load the game, you see these really, really rubbish assets. And as as time goes on, its background loads higher quality assets and replaces it. So the visual experience improves as time goes on. So for this, we have to think about the loading order. Like what is the most important 
thing to load after you've gotten into the game. You you need your your main visual experience to load first. Then you need your backgrounds, your sound. Then any any like and this like environmental animations that all will come last. This does have the drawback of if you have a bundled game. So if you bundle your game, say you're making an iOS app or an Android app, it will still go through these steps even though all the files are hosted locally. So you will still see because it's still a time hit. So you will still see rubbish asset being replaced by nice asset. But it does actually. It's one of the biggest ways to um, get really um, take chunks out of your load time. Um, lazy loading is um, the loading of modules as they're required. For example, websites are not allowed to play sound until a user interacts with it. So there is no point in loading the sound system subsystem before a game has opened and uh, somebody has started playing it. So we don't load um, sound systems, animations, um, all of that gets loaded later. And sound will get downloaded later and then first minimum viable amount of sound then sound and then the subsystem will only load once we start playing the sound playing the animation or anything like that so you don't you, you don't get the upfront performance hit from a subsystem being loaded if you're not going to use it if you are um you know if you're not using collision then why why would you load the collision system if you're not going to use it? Uh, this we do always have to keep in mind when developing because now you need to make your experiences that I need to play this animation. What happens if this animation is not ready? If the subsystem is not loaded, what do we do? So we have to have uh, backups that, um, you know, like um, fallback animations or something we can do in code so that you don't get a nothing experience but eventually um, just something to be um, a placeholder till the full experience is loaded in. Sprite cheating is what we do. Um, every time you load an asset, um, it's a hit on the CPU and GPU. So if every image was an individual image, it would be a, um, a lot of hits to load everything. So everything gets grouped into one image and one image gets loaded onto the GPU and then the GPU just shows a section of that image when displaying. So instead of um, 100 loads, you can just have three with three different sprite sheets. This is also the same thing with sound. Sound can also, is also get sprite sheeted. You have one sound file um, and when you play the sound, it just plays a snippet of the single sound file. So you only have to load one file and then um, it is quicker to play because it only needs to load once instead of multiple times. So for this, the file arrangement is important because you need to, we need to group our assets so that it's, they're quick to load, but you're not loading things that are unnecessary. So the minimum viable assets won't include anything that is not going to be used until, until late in the game. And then those um, larger sprite sheets for sections get loaded later. And then common sheets for things that um, um, span multiple scenes. We'll use one sheet so you don't load the same image multiple times because um, we really try and um, keep uh, image and audio duplication to zero. I think we're not allowed to duplicate anything. I think we fail checks if we do. Then we have platform-based loading. Um, not all browsers are equal. We have to have full, like we, we aim for near full device coverage. Um, so you can't just, uh, my game works on Chrome and then you go on uh, Safari and you say, oh, my game works on Safari, uh, but we only use WebP images. So this is the chart of the support of WebP and iOS Safari only started supporting WebP from iOS 14 which is in about, I think, 2022. So any iPhone lower than iOS 14 cannot display WebP, but WebP is a, a much better file format than PNG. It's way smaller. So if we, if we had the option, we would just load WebP. 
So the solution is we generate all of it. Um, we, we generate WebP, we generate PNG. Um, audio has, there's like five different audio formats you can use, each more um, smaller than the next one um, and better to use than the next one. But we don't know, you know, depending on your device, you, if you can't use WebP, you have to get the PNGs. So we generate all of them based on what uh, platform you're on, we'll then serve the smallest possible one. Um, but then this will increase your bundle size because um, unless you're doing platform specific bundles, you now have to load six copies of all your audio and you know two, three copies of all your images. You know, I wish we could use JPEG for everything, but JPEG has no um, transparency. Otherwise everything would be amazing and we could use one file format, but we can't. So after we do all of that, and we were still a little bit over the, um, the, the limit of our load time, we get to saving milliseconds. Um, we have to be very diligent with our code. Um, modern phones are powerful, but are limited by their hardware. Um, Ryan touched on it previously, where we had a, there's a Chinese browser it's built on a super old version of um, um, Chromium, and it lags. It uh, the games lagged and were slow and were awful. And uh, the um, way to solve it was to just mute the audio. Turns out they just can't play web audio, so we actually have to serve them a game that doesn't have audio and they don't load the audio at all. Um, then the next step. Uh, is draw calls when you are rendering a scene the renderer has to draw it now if you have um, something like blend modes every image with a blend mode that's not batched fires off another draw call and draw calls are one of the most expensive uh, um, GPU um, I'm going to say things I'm not a graphics dev Wayne can correct me um, so every draw call is a huge hit on the hit on the GPU and takes time. Um, even if it's 100 milliseconds, it's uh, if you have if you're not careful about the ordering of your blend modes and uh, with the Z ordering, if you have um, five images with blend modes and they're not layered correctly it will fire off a draw a draw call every time it tries to draw one of those images on top of the, the rest. I'll, I'll impress Ray and Wayne by my remembering about the painter's algorithm where it paints from bottom to top and it's like a t-shirt, like a color printer where you're printing one color at a time and every time you change color, you have to change the entire um, print head. So if you're doing blend modes, every time you change blend modes, you have to change the entire print head and it's uh, that takes a t um, that takes GPU time. So I had a we had uh, lights playing on the main scene. Um, each light had a blend mode. They weren't grouped together. So I think it was twenty five lights. Each light pretty much fires off a blend um, a draw call, which is um, super expensive. Then with how JavaScript works fundamentally, um, I just have. Yeah, my one point is arrays aren't arrays. Um, so if you arrays in programming terms have a set memory allocation, JavaScript arrays do not have a set memory allocation. So if you try and use a, an array to do things um, that JavaScript allows you to do with an array, um, for example, you can shift and unshift and you can push and pop, but whilst push and pop are is simple operations to do. If you are um, queuing things, if you want to do a um, first in, first out kind of system, you know, if you're using particles or you're just tracking anything and you want to pop the first item of the array, every time you do that is going to be a large hit because then that cascades and um, it's uh, ON notation. Um, every it touches every array element so if you have a scene with say a particle emitter and you're killing particles from the start of the array 
every single particle on screen is going to have its index updated and every single time you shift it's going to it's going to be doing that and that's gonna um uh if say another thing we do on loading is we actually pause the engine rendering because if you're trying to load the scene whilst it's trying to do that it's going to also slow down your load so another thing is don't run your engine while it's loading and that's the end of the speed run i've made it before eight o'clock any questions great thanks for that tim much appreciated um i have a question it might but it might be a um a very dumb one <laughs> and it might be something that you covered um do you, do you make use of any JavaScript APIs like Service Worker and things like that for, uh, for performance or caching or anything like that? Or is um, that just not possible with what you um, do? You see, now you say it's a dumb question, but you, you might make me sound dumb when I try and answer this question. Um, you see, because we, we use Webpack and everything, um, we do use caching. Um, we have to use cache busting because uh, so that if games get updated, the right, players on the serve yes. the cached, cached version of it. Right. Um, so we we do um, have all of those in place. So um, we do actually get tested on a fresh load and a cache load. Um, there mm -hmm. are two separate metrics. So for us, um, our cache load is is amazing. But a fresh load is not that amazing because we're making quite heavy visual experiences. Right. Um, so we we do have caching, and then we do. I think it's Webpack lazy loading, so we can load mm -hmm. chunks and all of right. that. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Thanks. Um, there's only one more question. Um, it's more again a general one, and. Um, Again, on you know, getting into game dev, and uh, where can you look for careers or anything like that? Uh, any advice on that from either of you? You know, Ryan likes talking about this, <laughs> and like my like my stand up in the morning, you muted, Ryan. Yeah, you muted, Ryan. <laughs> That's that that doesn't really happen anymore because. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just actually getting the getting the the, the careers page now, uh, so I will I will share the the Games Global careers page. It is just going to be value to keep an eye on Games Global uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I know that our marketing team is working quite hard on you know getting some nice engaging. Um, uh, so I can, sorry I can hear myself uh, engaging adverts talk specifically for developers and those need to come out as well uh some of our job profiles don't really look like game developer job profiles but i i assure you that they are sorry i'm just waiting for this chat to this chat to load so i can paste in unless wayne do you have it on okay never mind i got it i got it cool it should come through in in a moment i've just pasted in in, in the chat there in um uh on youtube so that, that's a place to check. Um, you know, there's, it depends as well. Uh, I just want to see uh, what else, if anyone's interested in jumping into this, where can I look for careers or anything like that? There are other companies in like, it depends where you're based. There are Cape Town. Cape Town seems to be the place where we have a lot of game devs. There's way more studios here than I thought. There's even uh, studios here that do work for triple A studios, international triple A studios, but they're under so many NDAs, they can't even add it to their profile. That's not an ideal place to be, but it does seem like people in that industry um, are aware of, of each other. And that is a viable way to, to go. Um, and then my next advice would be to get involved in, um, in the communities. Uh, as well, uh, I can invite you to my Discord server. I've started a mastermind there, a spin-off from Jason Wyman's uh, game de give guild that he had. So I'm also trying to build a community just to get like-minded people uh, together uh, so we can share 
uh, just job opportunities so we can we, we, we can discuss it uh, potentially even collaborate uh, together I know a youngster he just finished the game development track at uh, UCT and he did a online portfolio and I think he got a job offer the next day because he simply had a portfolio uh, you know and it's like it's really just like out of, out of university type of stuff but the guy's really talented and he showed enough uh, of it uh, on, on his portfolio and I'm, I still need to catch up with him if he actually accepted it but I was pretty sure he was getting a, he was getting that offer the, the the very very next day and that so um, there's a lot of facets here and that I'm very happy to to engage on it and find exactly what your situation looks like and try my best to help guide uh, put you in contact uh, with anyone that can potentially you know send you in the right direction if I can't that's great thanks um, Ryan only admins can post links in the chat uh, if you if you share it with oh, me in the chat Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add it from my side. Yeah. So it's just, uh, uh, there we go. Great. I'm gonna add that right now. Thanks so much for that. Spam, spam prevention. Yeah. Right. Cool. Done. Thanks so much. Great. Well, are there no other questions? I think we can end there. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryan and Tim, thank you so much for your time. It was very illuminating and our first real games focused um, session. So thanks so much for giving us your time um, spending this with us. Uh, as usual, this will, YouTube takes around a day to process the whole thing with the live chat and everything. And then it will be available uh, for re-watching and sharing. Uh, we will post it as always in the ZATEC Slack channel as we do and also on our uh, FEDSA uh, LinkedIn page. Yeah, great. So yeah, just uh, thanks again. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us. Yeah. Thanks for having us here. It was brilliant. Great. Thank you.